But at the end of the day, we're dealing with something that none of us really understand completely. It's extra pressure of having to like balance, like are we doing what's best for the community? Are we able to keep people safe? We decided to open during the pandemic. We as an industry were initially affected by the pandemic with the shutdown and everything. And um, we're really excited to be a part of this area and a part of the redevelopment of it. There is no doubt that the COVID pandemic has shaken our world and impacted communities in a variety of ways, depending on that community's unique situation. And Columbus is no different. Um, the Changing COVID Workforce Event Series is designed to help us as we examine our current responses to that changing environment and discover how to adapt as we move through and emerge following the pandemic. Please note that we want these discussions to remain positive and forward focused. You will likely have some questions during our panel discussion. And as you think of those, please go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A box on your screen. Our panelists will answer your questions during the question and answer portion of our discussion. Today, we want to explore the many shifts that have been necessary to keep our economy running and to keep our outlook moving forward in 2021. I know that we can learn from each other and grow stronger together. As we prepare for our panel today, I wanna to introduce Jamie Lloyd. Jamie is the Vice President of Economic Development and Strategic Partnerships at Columbus Technical College. Jamie is a certified economic development professional with more than 20 years of experience in both economic and workforce development. He sees himself first and foremost as an advocate for Columbus Technical College's service region, and he works to promote economic growth and attract new business. In this capacity, Jamie's work ensures that regional business and industry partners have the essential human capital necessary to succeed and to promote their region by demonstrating that not, they not only offer a strong workforce, but also boast a dynamic work, workforce development system producing future talent. So please help me as we welcome Jamie. He is going to share today with us a picture of workforce trends and post-COVID outlook. So Jamie, I will turn it over to you. Good morning and thank you, Kristen. Uh, just real quick check, uh, can everybody see the, my screen? The beginning of the slideshow, good. So uh, I am excited to be here this morning and thanks again, Kristen, for inviting me to participate in this discussion. It is extremely important. Um, this is a little bit different for me too because I think like most probably everybody else joining today, I participated in I don't know how many webinars and Zoom workshops since back in March and April, but this will be the first time I've actually done uh, an actual presentation via this platform. So it's interesting not having people sitting right here in an auditorium or a classroom, but uh, so I can't see. And so when they disagree with me, I won't be able to see your face, I don't guess, but uh, <laughs> it's, it could be good or bad. So we'll get we'll get started here. And, and, and let me let me mention too, one thing that's exciting about this is when Kristen first asked uh, me to participate in this back before the holidays, we had a number of conversations and they were great. Uh, a lot of topics, uh, a lot of micro topics to cover here and, and, and opportunities for discussion. And when this first started for, for the, the, the first bit, it was like, this was gonna be more about labor market information, especially uh, the trouble we have right now, the difficulty in actually seeing real time data with traditional sources and, and especially with forecasting. Um, it's a lot like reading tea leaves, I suspect, but uh, 
that was where it was going for the longest. And then last Friday, we had a great discussion with Kristen and some of her teammates and our team members, and it kind of morphed or evolved more to, in my role, working with business and industry partners. And, and again, I, I, I imagine a lot of you are on this uh, presentation today. So as I work with business and industry partners here in Columbus and throughout the region and, and, and planning their workforce training, you know, I, I get to see a lot um, and, and different industry partners. And so what, what are my observations, uh, especially since COVID started the pandemic back in March uh, and the social distancing and you know, some companies and some industries have done quite well, others not so much. And are there any characteristics that we can point out that might be uh, good or bad or help companies uh, going forward. So uh, it kind of, so, so today is kind of a, uh, an evolution, this, this topic, uh, multi-topics, and I'm going to try to get through it here in 20 minutes. Uh, I guess you can't stop me because I can't see you, but I know you can uh, ask questions for the discussion afterwards. So I'm going to launch right in. And, and also let me say that uh, last evening, I actually saw the, um, the, the invitation, I guess, most of you got to answer and respond and participate in today's forum. And I noticed on there it said uh, an economic overview, and I thought, uh, well, uh-oh, that's that's not exactly what I've been planning. So we don't ever want to disappoint our audience, and uh, if that's what you were coming to expect, I thought, well, maybe I should spend a, a little bit of time and, and put together a quick economic overview of our region. And so um, here you go. I know you're all shocked and stunned out there. But that pretty much sums up, I think, our economic situation at the moment. And uh, I know that upcoming um, webinars and sessions, we will focus more on the actual economic situation, I believe, uh, whether it's GDP growth or whether it's uh, uh, economic uh, uh, revenue per capita or whatever we measure it. I think it is worth looking at that too. But today we're going to look more at labor force uh, information and some uh, trends we're seeing there. So when it comes to LMI, uh, I mentioned LMI being labor market information. I've been doing this for over 20 years and for some reason I actually enjoy doing it and, um, it, and it's always interesting, but especially in times like this, uh, much like uh, 10 years ago when, when we were going through the recession, that was a huge game changer and disruptive force uh, in the economy especially, but certainly in the labor markets too. It was a game changer. And now fast forward uh, to 2020 and 2021, and this, this situation is probably even more disruptive. Uh, it, it's kind of new territory for a lot of people. Uh, and so doing, getting real-time data to kind of figure out what's going on is one thing. And I think we can help with that here today, but forecasting going forward is kind of a broken model now because forecasting is based on previous behavior of whatever uh, the market we're looking at. So we can still do that, but the thing now, of course, is the market isn't behaving the same way. So I can't forecast out, I can, but it would be uh, very, not very reliable information. So uh, looking at labor market information now, and, and especially when it comes to forecasting, uh, somebody asked me, how do you do it? Well, you go to the grocery store and you get the best tea brand you can get, and then you stare incessantly at it for hours, and you may get some idea of what's going on. <laughs> um, it really is almost that challenging at this point to forecast. Uh, if, if, if you wanna have a discussion about methodologies and techniques, and uh, I'll be glad to share you know, a, a good reading list with you. Um, I don't know how helpful it'll be, but absolutely uh, we, can, we can look at labor market information and how we forecast, but Forecasting aside, what can we say about uh, the current labor market and how it's behaving since COVID uh, and get some ideas perhaps at least where we are today and might give us a little bit of outlook about going forward. So two things we'll look at here real quickly. First is the overall uh, weekly initial unemployment claims. And the, this comes straight from our Georgia Department of Labor. And all of this data that I'll be sharing with you, uh, unless I say otherwise, will be for Columbus, Muskogee County specifically, not the region, not the MSA or the state, but Muskogee County. So what you see here first uh, on the slide is this is the weekly initial unemployment claims by week. And this started back the first week of March. 
And just to give you some idea, I mean, of course, you can see the spike there, but the first week of March, there were, I believe, 106 uh, initial claims. By the third week of March, uh, it grew to 2,144 that week. And then the first week of April, you can see the spike, 6,146 claims here in Muskogee County just in that one week. And then you can follow the line there and you can kind of see how uh, fortunately it started coming back down. Again, this is week by week unemployment claims here in Columbus. Uh, still isn't quite down to the uh, pre-COVID uh, Point. I think the last week we have there is the second week of January and it was at 685. So still not quite where it was back in March, but it is, I think, heading in the right direction. And so, you know, one question I, I know would come up. And so just to preempt that, you know, how does that look compared to the state of Georgia along the same timeline? So I juxtaposed, I, I, first I had to index the scale so they would represent to be apples to apples. And so what you can see here, the black line, of course, is still Columbus, Muskogee. The red line is the state of Georgia throughout that same time period. And I think what you can see is for the most part, except for maybe this little area, which would represent, I guess, the summer months, you can see that for the most part, we were in lockstep with the state when it comes to unemployment insurance claims. Interesting, um, it tells us, I think our economy, at least the job market is reacting much like the state as a whole. All right, so now uh, I thought it would be interesting because what I've shown you so far as far as unemployment claims, these are this is total unemployment claims across all industries, all occupations. So I thought it might be interesting uh, to look at some specific uh, industries and see how the, each industry might be reacting compared to the whole. The first industry here you will see is healthcare. Uh, this is the two, two digit NAICS code for healthcare industry. You can see uh, for the most part, except for the spike, uh, the one spike, you can see that for the most part, it's th that industry has kind of run lockstep with overall performance. Um, finance and insurance. Uh, of course, we have a big finance and insurance industry uh, with big partners here and a significant uh, industry. This is interesting. You can hardly see, you see the little gray line running across the bottom which kind of represents a good thing. Um, even though they did have some, some unemployment going on, it was nothing like the, the, uh, the overall industries or, or some of the other specific. And, and, and I'll come back to this one on the flip side and, and when we're looking at uh, hiring behaviors because it really paints, I think, an interesting picture, at least for that industry. All right, retail trade, maybe not a surprise here, certainly in the beginning. Uh, and again, this would be uh, around March and April months. And so not a real big surprise, big spike there. Uh, since then, I mean, it has started working its way back down. And, and I guess for the last year or the last uh, seven or eight months, perhaps, it's kind of mirrored what the rest of the industries are doing. It gets worse, <laughs> at least looking at the chart. Accommodations and food services, again, probably given the nature of, of the pandemic and the, the social distancing, and it's probably no surprise here, accommodations, hotels, motels, uh, restaurants, you know, when we couldn't go to the restaurants and we couldn't go to hotels, well, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so I think that's pretty much represented here. What a tremendous spike uh, right there at the beginning. Um, but, but again, the good news, I think, is it, it is starting to behave like the rest of the industries. And I think that's a good trend and hopefully it will continue in that direction. Uh, finally, and I'm not going through all the uh, individual industries. The last one I'll throw up there because we're always interested in manufacturing, of course, and is a, a prominent and significant industry sector here. So you can see uh, there, there, there's been a little more volatility, I think, in the manufacturing sector. Uh, there's, that's the brown line. It's getting kind of busy here, I see. But you can tell the little brown line that represents the manufacturing industry in Columbus. You can see multiple spikes uh, along the way, which, again, is a little bit interesting. Uh, and one last thing I'll say about this, and then we'll move to the other side of it, is these, are all, these all represent two-digit NAICS code, which is the highest level industry code. So when we say manufacturing, for instance, we're all, we're all guilty of this. We always just kind of throw it around and we talk about manufacturing. How is manufacturing doing in Columbus? How is manufacturing doing in the state? Uh, the, the issue there is, and it comes to bear with these slides, 
is even within the manufacturing industry, there's lots of, of variations. There's lots of diversity. When you have aer aerospace uh, manufacturing, which could look their line, if I broke it out by just aerospace, like Pratt & Whitney or Macaulay, uh, it, it would look totally different, I suspect, than this. Uh, food processing manufacturing, again, probably look a lot different. So this is just manufacturing as a whole, which is a little bit vague, but it kind of gives you an idea of what each industry sector is doing along that trend line. Okay, flipping to the other side of the coin, and this is, this is more, I think, the positive news is this is the hiring behaviors. So what we have just been looking at is the unemployment insurance claims week by week in each industry. So what we're looking at now um, through job, I, I come up with this data by doing job uh, posting analytics, by looking at all the Indeed and the monster.coms and thousands and thousands. And I don't actually sit there and do that one by one. We have uh, data engines that do that and search and come back with the reports. So we're able to trend um, uh, hiring behaviors as represented by job postings. And so what we have here, and again, this is just for Columbus, Muskogee County. And I put here 24 months worth of job posting uh, month by month. And so again, this is for the Muskogee region, uh, Columbus. And what you will see that yeah, I shaded out the uh, from March through I think June, which is pretty much the, the hot spot for the COVID pandemic. And what you'll see here, this started back in January of 2019. And this is job postings per month across all industries. And you can see the trend line. And, and then again, here, you can see when March came along, uh, it, did, it did go down and continued down, I'd say until June. But the good news is, is since then it's trending upwards. Uh, to give you some idea about what that looks like numbers, uh, well, I calculated the drop from March to June and, and actual job posting is a 20% drop. Uh, back the same time last year, just for some comparison, and this is just one snapshot in time, uh, but it actually, last year, the same three month period actually went up by almost 16%. So there, there is significant variation. Again, not, not surprising because given the nature of the pandemic and the labor market. Uh, now, when I index this again to, uh, to 100 so I can uh, compare apples to apples, so to speak, uh, this is the, still the same trend line you see, but this time, I, now I can start adding the other industries over it. And again, this, is, this, is, this would be job postings for each of these industries, again, the same timeline. Now, so healthcare, uh, what I would pay attention to again is, is the pandemic period when it started. And as you can see, and, and again, if you think about it, it's almost intuitive, not really a surprise here uh, as the region, all of the industries as a whole started declining in job posting activity, healthcare actually started going up and continues to go up. And again, um, uh, you, you know, they're, they're pretty busy right now and I know they're needing help. And, and so no surprise there that the hiring activity continues to go up. Now, here's the interesting one. I mentioned finance and insurance before on the other side, when it came to the unemployment claims, you know, they were kind of flat, especially compared to the other industries and the region as a whole. Now, when you look at this side at the hiring activity, um, I mean, it started way back last year, but by the time it gets to, to March, I mean, yes, it does still take a dip, but this is hiring activity, at least represented by job postings. So, if you look at the two together, what it kind of tells me, and it's not an exact science, but if they're not, if we're not seeing a lot of unemployment along that, that line from before, but we still see uh, uh, a contraction of their hiring activities via uh, job postings, it kind of just indicates, I think, that they're kind of holding their own. They hadn't had to let a whole lot of people go. I hope that's right. And, and, but of course, at the same time, they're not really hiring like they were before as well. So looking at these things kind of together, in, in some cases can give you an idea of which industries are doing what. And again, just like with manufacturing, there's even variation within finance and insurance. So it doesn't mean that all of them are doing good or all of them are doing bad, there's variation. So just keep pointing that out uh, as we go. Uh, adding manufacturing again, uh, not, not, a real big surprise here as well uh, in that, uh, yes, the beginning of March, you see the job postings drop significantly down um, and then they come back up and then they're going back down again. 
But again, there's so much variation out there right now. I mean, we've had some major manufacturers here in Columbus that uh, not only have had to lay off or furlough, but have unfortunately shut down. And we lost Gildan during this time period. You probably saw the announcement last week that uh, Campbell will be closing over the next 18 months. So there, there's certainly some bad news going on there. Uh, but at the same time, we have some of our companies that like PathTech, for instance, that's growing, bursting at the seams with growth. Uh, does it hurt? I suppose that their main product right now are, are the COVID testing kits. So uh, you can imagine they're, they're growing like crazy and we're trying to help them recruit and hire and train, but it's, it's a good problem to have, but still a problem. So again, the variation there, even within any of these industries is something to keep in mind. All right, now real quickly, shifting to the last part, um, you know, in my, I guess I have somewhat of a unique vantage point working with a lot of the business and industry partners over time. Again, several of you, I, I imagine. And, and so, yes, I observed things. And, and when we were talking about this, I just started jotting some of them down. And then, then I started researching it. And uh, that's where I usually get in trouble. But in researching, you know, I call some other colleagues from other areas and, and kind of pick their brains and then look online and see what the you know, the talking heads at the national level are saying, and, and they're really kind of saying the same thing, which I think validates a lot of my observations. So a lot of them say it better. So I've used some of their words, but and I'll try to give real examples here as we go and move through this pretty quick. So some, some of the observations that have to do, I think, with characteristics that will affect uh, a company locally or probably at any other level, excuse me, uh, one is the industry you're in. Uh, again, we've talked about industry now as far as uh, is, is unemployment and laying off and closing. And we've talked about hiring again and hiring behaviors. But again, keep in mind, so a great example here, uh, you know, think of one of our biggest partners here in town, Pratt & Whitney, uh, part of the aerospace manufacturing industry. Well, again, knowing what we know about COVID and the pandemic and the social distancing and knowing what's happened to the airlines during this time, no surprise that you know that's their line of business and so they've had to uh, do different things take on back work and they've had to uh, diversify to, 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 to keep the doors open and keep going and they have and, and that's a tribute to them I think but but it has to do a lot with their industry their specific industry some some of these things are structural which I mentioned in a moment and we, we really can't help here on the ground level but we still have to deal with it and live with it and learn how to overcome it so Knowing what industry you're in, you're in the healthcare industry. Well, again, you saw the trends a while ago. Maybe there's a much better chance that you will grow your business wheel during this time. Uh, finance, insurance, all in the same. So industry does have a lot to do uh, with you know, our success rate, but I don't think it's the only thing. I mentioned uh, it is one macro structure. The macro, the structural changes are things that happen if we were doing a SWOT analysis, this is the T, the outside threats that threaten us here locally. Uh, and some of the ones I mentioned, the unemployment benefits, uh, the extended unemployment benefits. When I mention this and talk about it, I'm not going not to uh, linger on this because I don't mean it in a pejorative manner, not negative, not positive. Depends on, I suppose, which side you're looking at or which vantage point you have. But I have heard a number of employers say, especially those that had to lay off or put people on furlough, that when they come to uh, hiring back and getting back up and running, they've had a difficult time. Uh, bringing back their uh, previous team members and some with big skill sets, important skill sets they need. And that's been, a, that's been an issue. And, and again, that's just coming, that's anecdotal coming from the employers. So yes, it could be a good thing. People certainly need help during these times, financial help. At the same time, it can be uh, an issue that our employers have to deal with when they're bring, trying to bring their workers back. So another thing to keep in mind. The economy, I don't think I have to linger on that. The national economy, global economy, uh, certainly has a lot to do with uh, our, our economy here. Politics, again, I'll stay a mile away from being pejorative, good or bad, right, left, doesn't matter. That what matters is there's a change in politics at the national level. It always brings differences. The new administrations, um, they'll have different policies, different outlooks, and they'll bring that the budgets will change. Uh, and so same thing here. Uh, one thing I'd point out as far as local, we have Fort Benning, and then we also have some companies here that rely heavily, I think, on, on government contracts. So 
historically speaking, uh, when we have a democratic regime, usually they spend less money in the budget on like military or government contracting. This, 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 this administration may do something totally different. And again, I'm not saying good or bad, but it is one of those macro things we have to keep in mind because it will, depending if it goes up, it's a good thing. If it goes down, it could be harmful to our local uh, economy. So we just have to keep that in mind as again, it's one of those high level things that we don't have all the control over. Bailout stimulus, still again, a, a national level, you know, government sometimes they're an arbiter and, and which is a good thing, I think, uh, because sometimes they bail out certain industries like the automobile industry back in the recession, airline industry this time, and I think it's a good thing. Uh, so they can certainly make a huge difference there. Uh, just like uh, the stimulus payments to individuals, again, I think it's a good thing, it certainly pumps money into the economy. And th again, those are top level factors we all have to be aware of and because they affect us here. Um, telecommuting. <laughs> We've all had to face that since March. I can tell you, um, I could probably spend the, you could probably spend an entire session on just this, but there's a lot of learning to be done when it comes to telecommuting. I know a lot of, a lot of us traditionalists uh, before COVID didn't necessarily embrace fully the telecommuting. It's, it's not a new thing. It's been around for a long time. Um, some of us might've paid lip service to it, but we really didn't pursue it. Uh, well, now we've had to. And, and so I think that train has left the station. One thing I learned, number one, the hard way over the summer is it, it takes a different skill set, I think, for people to work uh, at a distance or virtually, also for supervisors and leaders. Uh, it's a whole different communication set there. And, and so if you haven't, if you, if you have had to embrace telecommuting and will continue, you probably need to look at getting some specific training for your employees and your supervisors and how they make that transition, because it is important. It's not the same thing. Uh, it's like we're not in Kansas anymore. And same old skill sets don't, don't always play across. So uh, be thinking about that. Also, how do you recruit and hire? Uh, if you're thinking going forward that you're gonna be doing more telecommuting, you know, how are you hiring and recruiting? Because it opens up the market perhaps, and also skill sets, what are you looking for? And then how do you, uh, how do you uh, reward your employees? different things. One quick example there, I heard one company say, well, since we're not here, we we're saving, I forgive, it was like $5,000 uh, a week or a month and snacks and whatnot for the break room. So they don't have to do that anymore. So what they decided to do was purchase uh, snack cards, gift cards uh, for their employees so they could go buy their own snacks. It's just an idea, but little things like that going forward, I think are important. Bill Synergy, um, working with other companies in the area, not as competitors, but uh, as resources to leverage their resources. I've seen some great examples of that here in Columbus, actually even before the pandemic, but certainly since. Uh, again, I'll mention Path Tech real quick. As they're expanding and, and, and just at an exponential rate, they've been able to work with some other local companies, smaller companies, to take on some of their load and produce and, and run some of the lines at their place. And, and so it's a win-win. And so anything we can do like that to look across and see how we can help somebody else and, and in turn them help us, uh, there's all kinds of opportunities out there just have to be open for it and looking for it. Uh, real quickly, just about their circular economy. These are things, and again, I, I, if you're like me, when I go through these and I see them, I think, yes, I've seen that, I know it, but, it's, but, but then when you put it down on paper and you, th you think about it a little bit, it, it, and from a business perspective, I think we have to start thinking about these things going forward and how we change our business model if we do uh, along these lines. Circular economy meaning rent versus buy. We've seen that well before the pandemic, but now people tend to rent uh, uh, before they go buy something. A lot of rental companies are doing quite well. Uh, I think that will only continue to accelerate. And then the purchase used and refurbished. How many places have we seen online? We see, we've seen them here locally, but also how many you see online that sale, well, eBay, of course, being the biggest one, but others now are the proliferation of these kind of companies. So there's a trend out there where people are buying used uh, and refurbished before they're buying. So again, if you're, if, you're a, if you're selling a product, you might want to think about that. And then maybe this is last, but certainly not least, digital uh, e-commerce, digital shopping has certainly, um, it is certainly proliferated and even more so since the pandemic. We all like to shop when we get ready to, and all we got to pick, pick our smart, smartphone on. So especially if you're a retail, think about traditional storefront, which hopefully will be important again, 
uh, but how that translate and, and transfers over to the digital, to online e-commerce. And, and, and if you're not following that, that trend, um, you, you really need to get somebody to help with that because that is so important. Your website being able to reach the market and it really broadens your horizons and your market. So um, with that, I think training and development, and this is the last thing, labor, whatever you can do. I know a lot of people don't think about training their employees during this time because some people are trying to keep the doors open and I get that, I do. Uh, other companies out there are actually taking the opportunity to cross train during this time. Uh, so when they do come back, they have new skill sets learned. Uh, apprenticeships are really big right now and there's tons of grant money out there to pay for the training. So if you think about training at all, and this is not a plug for Columbus Tech, but do look into uh, what resources are out there for taking advantage of training at this point in time. All right, so I think I'm at the 20 minutes possibly over and I will turn it back over at this, well, at this point, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. David White as our moderator for the panel. Uh, Dr. White uh, just retired back in September. I uh, envy him a little bit uh, from serving as vice chancellor over at uh, Troy University campus over in Phoenix City. And before that, he retired from the military as a colonel after 26 years. And so he's a good friend and colleague. And so Dr. White, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for that uh labor market overview and your follow on observations, which I think sets us up for the rest of the program. Um, we're gonna transition into short presentations by four more panelists, um, each about under 10 minutes. Uh, and then uh, Jamie will join the panel and uh, we'll have a Q and A period uh, following that. So let me start by, uh, introducing our first panelist. Uh, and each panelist will sort of give us a sense of the impact of COVID on the labor market and on their labor force from their sort of a different, uh, in each case, a different sector standpoint. Let me start by introducing Dr. Gail Burgess, uh, who is the former senior diversity and inclusion officer at Total Systems, uh, now Global Payments. Um, her background uh, is uh, in various leadership positions for uh, over 20 years in the financial uh, technology sector. Uh, she has background in human resources management, in organizational leadership. Um, and uh, uh, Gail, tell us a little bit about how you think the labor force uh, has been, is impacted and has been impacted uh, by COVID. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the humble introduction. Uh, I'm honored to be here today. Um, and definitely as a representative of the Columbus community, uh, which has been my home for well over 30 years. Um, I will just share from you know a very uh, personable perspective, um, being here recently retired myself. Um, but you know, as the impact of COVID um, and the pandemic it started to um, unveil itself across the world uh, back in 2020. Um, what I did notice is that there were several um, things that happened as a synergy, not just in the Columbus area, but throughout the United States and around the world, um, where we were all in that area of doing two things, uh, assessing our own perspective um, and then uh, I, what I call the second critical P is making pivotable plans. Um, and that became the buzzword uh, in 2020. You know, you had to be able to shift and make a, a pivot in order to survive. But going back to uh, perspective, um, I think each day, uh, each of us in our own right was glued to the televisions and to the news and to the devices on our phones, uh, making our own assessment. Um, of what we were receiving uh, as far as information, the impact that was there unveiling before us, uh, not from just a labor perspective and an employment, but also within our own homes um, and in our own communities. And I think that that was so important uh, for each of us um, as leaders, as uh, providers of, for our families, that perspective and that assessment that was being made. Um, it then came down to 
you know, how do we go and how do we start to make those pivotable adjustments? And that's where that key word comes in around pivotable plans. Um, as leaders, um, I, what I did experience and start to see was that leaders in the community, leaders in business, uh, entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurs uh, who own their own business, church leaders, um, it did not matter from what industry or what um, background that you actually came from, you had to start to come together and to start sharing your ideas uh, with one another. And that was one of the things that I also saw in the leadership realm is that many leaders came together to share their perspective, their assessment, and to start even sharing their plans of what they wanted to do um, as they made those pivotal adjustments. And I think that sharing opportunity as people were making the assessments from a safety perspective, from a health perspective, from benefits to where do you start to shift and actually start to make the decisions to work from home? How much of your labor force can actually start to work from home? And then what does that mean? Um, I think as leaders, they started to see several pivotal changes actually start to happen as well. Um, and I, I like to attest those two, uh, two factors in particularly, trust. Uh, we started to see trust actually um, increase from, um, from the, the worker to their immediate supervisor because you're not in, um, in the actual work environment, work setting. And so I'm having to trust that you are going to do your job and to do it well. And we started to see productivity actually increase. Um, that was one of the things that um, many of the leaders shared in the various forums is that productivity um, and success rates actually started to increase as a result of the pandemic. And in the work that I was in, diversity and inclusion, when we talk about engagement, you know, how was the engagement with our employees and our team members actually going to be impacted? Um, we started to see collaboration actually increase as well. Um, people, you know, had to rely on technology as we are here today uh, to be able to collaborate and engage with one another more so. So the engagement actually started to go up. And we all know once you actually uh, have engagement, productivity increases. And, and so that was some of the great benefits that we actually started to see. Um, with the last thing that I will actually notate um, that was near and dear to my heart was the impacts of, of women um, in the workforce. And being a WNET board member, um, that was several of the conversations that we talked about. And as women and as mothers, you know, had to make those transitions uh, from the pandemic and what that meant for them as, as working people, um, we looked at, you know, not only of them being um, workforce, but they are the caregivers. Uh, if they were caring for family members who had been impacted by COVID, um, they were also having to become educators. Uh, you know, if they had children, school-aged children, that was now um, in the home setting as well. And what those adjustments actually meant for them throughout their workday. And so that was, again, some great conversations that we not only held uh, within the WNET organization, but I had the opportunity to speak with women throughout many of the organizations and, and locations throughout the world that I um, have a network with. And what we saw was that common factor, you know, those challenges that many of the women faced. And McKinsey actually just did a recent report, uh, which they did share, where they saw where one in three women are actually now um, impacted and deciding whether they're going to return to the, to the workforce. Um, having to have wear so many hats that they're wearing today, uh, being again, educators, providers, working from home, or even still having to be, uh, as we call critical workers in, in the workforce and having to report to work each day. So those were just some of the decisions that are still being made. And um, again, I will just say in closing around pivoting, I think you know many of us, again, are having to make those pivotal decisions of how do we move forward? How do we continue to progress in this ever-changing? And it, we're having the, to continue to make those assessments each and every day. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity and I look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. We appreciate your comments. Um, if you do have questions for Dr. Burgess or any of the panelists as we proceed, just put them in the Q&A 
uh, section uh, down below on your screen, and we'll try to get to those um, uh, uh, during the follow-on session. Um, let me transition now to our uh, our second panelist, uh, Mr. Trent Davidson, who is the uh, uh, general sales manager for Buffalo Rock and is responsible for both a division uh, in the Columbus area and at Albany. He has a workforce, they have a workforce of about 100 people and uh, uh, Trent has, uh, has been with uh, Buffalo Rock for eight years, I believe. And um, uh, uh, Trent is gonna be able to give us uh, sort of a window into retail, in this case, soft drink uh, retail. So I'll turn it over to you, Trent. I appreciate it. And thanks so much for uh, letting me be a part of, of such a um, intelligent and uh, impressive panel. I really appreciate it. Um, a lot of the things that, that Dr. Burgess was just speaking through um, are, are kind of a direct impact to our level and into our, um, our system and to what we do each day. Um, something that's very important to me uh, that I've made sure to keep forefront throughout all this is that um, no one cares what you know until they know uh, that you care. Um, <clears throat> you know, that was something that uh, was instilled in me very young at a young age and um, that, that really um, showed the benefits of as we progressed through this and, and this pandemic came about. Um, you know, my background comes from uh, the athletic field at a high level, um, and that's great in the competitive world. Um, but when you start dealing with something like this, with um, each individual employee, with the way that things impact people on different levels, um, you know, you can't have the locker room mentality all the time or the competitive mentality all the time. Um, so making sure to keep that care uh, at the forefront um, has, was, was very beneficial as we went into this. And then um, Buffalo Rock, the company that I'm with, um, is a fourth generation um, in leadership since 1901 and, and prides itself on servicing, um, being a servant leader, developing um, and helping those be successful. Um, when, when this came about, um, we were deemed essential, um, which brought about a lot of questions um, and, and obviously put us right there um, in the stores, somewhat on the front line, not from a healthcare perspective, not to uh, make that comparison, but out in the middle of it. Um, you know, when you, when you think about what we bring to the table, um, as far as the water products that we have, uh, someone is diagnosed with COVID, um, they're gonna be told a lot of times to have a Gatorade Zero uh, to help with hydration, things like that. The family being more at home around the dinner table um, and also refreshment and uh, being a treat, a way to get away possibly. Um, so as this came on, we had to, uh, <clears throat> to make a lot of adjustments, but um, what I go to work with every single day uh, is, is three things, glorify God and all that we do, um, get everyone home safe um, and put people in a position to be more successful year over year. Um, the company shares those same things. And so um, I, I put together a few things that we did um, and, and some of the things that we overcame and worked through. Um, and I appreciate our head of HR here, Ms. Dina Berger, putting those together. She keeps us all in line and, and helps me uh, put some of these together. So um, as was mentioned earlier, um, the pandemic unemployment uh, assistance supplement uh, was something that, that um, affected our recruiting. Um, it, it also affected um, our temporary employee service uh, providers. Um, it, it, it gave us some trouble in hiring. Um, also, um, COVID did shut down uh, all of our job fairs. Um, Goodwill was, was one of the first uh, that came out in our community, I believe, and um, you know, made it a, a virtual through Zoom. And uh, so we've been able to, to have some success for that. But um, what we did to help overcome some things was we moved uh, to FaceTime, um, to Zoom interviews to eliminate exposure. Um, we do COVID uh, assessments uh, on anyone that is a face-to-face -face, uh, that does have to come to our facility. Um, we provide a $625 referral bonus to our employees for all positions. Um, that's paid out at a 96 month, one year. 
Uh, we provide a $1,250 sign-on bonus for all positions. Uh, we also changed our personal day policy to where it used to be a four to six month accrual and now it's four days in the first 90 days. Um, we also changed our vacation policy. It used to be one week at one year, now it's one week at six months and, and two, uh, two more weeks at one year. Um, <clears throat> the steps that we took when COVID hit, um, immediately we did COVID assessments on all employees, uh, questionnaires to find out who had been where doing what. Um, we also started taking temperatures of all visitors, having them sign uh, waivers stating that they were not showing symptoms. Um, we provided PPE for all employees, uh, many different types of masks, hand sanitizer, wipes, Lysol spray, uh, disinfectant bombs for vehicles. Um, we also provided two essential worker bonuses, uh, one of $150, one of $300. Uh, we reimbursed employees who had to take vacation and personal days uh, due to being out or having positive exposure. Um, and we started providing tests on site to make sure that it's quicker um, faster and eliminate um, days employees are having to wait to return to work if negative. Um, and we'll also start providing vaccines in 2001 or later this year, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> we at our corporate office have a corporate health and wellness officer. Um, and the impact I think sometimes goes unnoticed, but just being able to provide uh, tips and guidance, you know, uh, posters being in the hallway about breathing techniques to help with anxiety and things like that. Those might not be um, seen as, as very valuable until someone is in the middle of that dealing with those things. Um, and, and obviously with this, um, with, with unknown, there's a lot of fear that's been behind it. So things like employment uh, assistance services and resources from a mental health standpoint have been very key and vital um, as we went through. Um, from the caring standpoint, um, the president of our company, Matthew Dent, um, as well as our uh, director of compliance, Ms. Candace Hamilton, visited every division. I mean, there were multiple topics that were discussed, but one of those was COVID, was the response, wanting to hear what we did well, what do we do not so well, what do y'all need, what's going on? Um, and then on a, uh, on a ground level, one of the pivots that we made that was mentioned earlier um, in, in businesses where you do have a vending machine or uh, places of congregation, um, we pivoted to really give a lot of info out towards a micro market that we um, can come in and set up. It's kind of like a shop at uh, and can be non-touch. Um, some other perks towards our employees, um, an, e an uh, employee voice to where we want to hear ideas. There's a reward each month, $500 and $2,500 for the best over the year. A sprinkle program that's somewhat of a catch them doing something nice um, or doing well, uh, $50 for that. Um, and then multiple donations throughout the community just to try to help and provide. So I kind of wanted to give an array of what we've done um, kind of in every aspect and, and facet. Uh, and I'm most proud uh, to be able to say that um, I feel that every one of our employees uh, do care what we know because they do know that we care. And so again, I thank y'all for the time and I look forward to, uh, to any questions or anything that anyone would like to know more about that I've discussed, um, please reach out. Uh, thank you, Trent. Uh, a couple of things uh, occurred to me when you were presenting. One was in the way that you, to use uh, Dr. Burgess's uh, uh, term, the way you pivoted when, when COVID hit, uh, a lot of uh, activities around protecting your employees and your workforce. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and, and those were not just health-based. In many cases, they were, they were mental health-based as well. And then uh, a lot of incentives for your employees, your workforce, uh, knowing that they're in difficult times. You found some interesting ways, it, sound, it sounds to me like, you found some interesting ways to give financial incentives uh, to your current workforce. And then um, from your initial comments, obviously uh, strategies to, um, to recruit more. It, it sounds as if you, you had some difficulties recruiting for a while, as, as many companies have had, especially uh, 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 many companies have had, um, especially when you're up against um, unemployment benefits that are that are increased 
And so some of those interesting uh, incentives that uh, you're using to attract uh, new employees for, for your work to your workforce uh, uh, seems to me is, is part of your is part of your success. Right. Um, if you have any questions for Trent, uh, please go ahead and put them in the Q and A uh, uh, section uh, uh, below your uh, at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to them in the Q and A portion. Um, our next presenter is uh, is uh, Ms. Sandrika Lakes. Uh, Sandrika is the executive vice president. Uh, of education, talent, and uh, workforce at the Greater Columbus Chamber of Commerce. Um, Sidrika has been in that role about four years, and for perhaps the seven years preceding that, she was involved in uh, various work in technical and career education. So career education, technical education, uh, is, her, is her forte. Um, uh, her job is uh, at the chamber has to do with aligning uh, the pipeline of education with our current and future workforce. She works on, she's worked on a number of projects in that area. Uh, Sandrika, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, um, Dr. White, for um, having me and the Georgia Center for Opportunity for hosting this event. Um, the Chamber of Commerce as a whole, as an organization, is just... Um, it's really an organization that advocates for the voice of business. So it's our responsibility to really keep a pulse on what is happening in the business community, whether that business be a 5,000 um, person employer or whether it be a two person employer. And I think today I really bring um, for you guys a unique perspective of what's happening with our small businesses. So just kind of to, to get a baseline of information. Um, I want you guys to really understand how impactful and how important small businesses um, are to not only our um, labor market, but our community and our um, local economics as a whole. Just in general, across the nation, small businesses outnumber corporations a thousand fold. So for every corporation, there are more than 1000 small businesses. And when I say small business, I mean um, businesses that have less than 50 employees. Over half, nearly 60% of our workforce are actually employed by small businesses. Um, so most of the payroll that happens every 1st and 15th or um, biweekly, however it is that you're getting paid, most of those people are getting paid by small business owners. Um, and most of those small businesses are owned by just one person. So why is that important, you know, while we're in the midst of a global pandemic? Um, it's important because for small businesses, anytime um, small businesses have to close because of a national disaster, natural disaster or for any reason, if those businesses are closed for more than 10 days, um, most of them will not survive. So when you look at businesses having to close or having to um, alter how they do business, for almost a year, um, you can just imagine the effect that and the impact that will have on a small business. Um, and the fact that our small businesses are struggling and coupled with um, what I just told you about how they employ uh, most of our workforce, um, we find ourselves in a position where a lot of people, those who are being employed by small business owners are not having the opportunities to return back to work. Um, it's very difficult for small businesses to be more flexible, more agile, and to pivot and adapt into these circumstances um, because a lot of them don't have resources. Uh, when we first started, when the global pandemic first started and businesses were having to close, um, I was fielding tons of calls from small businesses just to help them set up um, their accounts at the Department of Labor so they could get their employees unemployment. Um, it's a lot more complicated for small businesses um, because they only have one person that's handling the payroll, that's handling the HR versus a corporation 
that has, you know, a team of 30 people handling these functions. And so what does that mean to an individual who works for a doctor's office that employs six people? Is that when you are faced with these opportunities now and in the future, um, you have to really look at that small business and evaluate how agile they can be in these circumstances and how you can contribute to that. Um, you will find that working for a small business can be very rewarding. Um, and a lot of times they are very loyal to their employees, but how can you contribute to their ability to adapt? Um, what do you bring to the table? How can you be an asset to them when they are trying to determine how they're going to shift um, their business model from a brick and mortar business to um, an e-commerce business? Um, and understanding your goals, not, not just your goals, but your skill set and how it can contribute to that will be a game changer, if, especially if you're employed by a small business owner. Okay, thank you, Cedric. I appreciate it. Um, let's go on to our uh, final panelists uh, in this portion of the, of the program. Uh, uh, Trisha Conan, who is the Vice President of uh, Mission Services for Goodwill Industries of the of the Southern Rivers. Uh, by the way, that's an organization that covers 50 counties. It's a it's a big organization with a big footprint. Um, Trisha's background is in uh, both the private and public public and education sectors. She's been with Goodwill for about six years, and um, the focus of Goodwill and, and and her focus has a lot to do with uh, workforce training and workforce development for employment. So developing a quality workforce, specifically career navigation, skills training, financial services, and employee recruitment. You you heard Trent um, mention that uh, uh, his company relies on Goodwill as part of the pipeline for um, uh, for new employees. Uh, so Trisha, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. White, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel. I, um, at Goodwill, we have an opportunity to uh, see this workforce challenge from multiple perspectives. One, as an employer, as you said, our organization covers 50 counties and we have 700 employees with our organization. Second, from a worker perspective, throughout our footprint, our ultimate goal is to help change lives through the power of work. So we have the opportunity on an annual basis to engage with tens of thousands of workers uh, in our territory. And when the pandemic hit, um, as some of our panelists already alluded to, they really had to individually deal with uh, their household first. One, concern with their own personal health and safety and that impact um, depending on the type of work that they're in, two, the impact of childcare and school closures, and then three, the employment reality of their particular employer. As Sindrika just mentioned, the vast majority of our workforce in this area is with small business. So many having to deal with the realities of layoffs and in some instances, actual closure um, based on the impact of uh, the pandemic. So for us, we too um, had to embrace the, the moniker of the year, which is to pivot. One, uh, in reaching our clients, in ensuring that we were at the ready to help them, those that were able and willing to go back to work to find those um, employment opportunities. So the other client that we focus on is our employer base. So many of our employers had to unfortunately made some very difficult decisions to shutter their business either short term. Or I am pleased to say just as um, Jamie's economic outlook, many of our employer partners have opened their doors again to hiring and their businesses are coming back online and are seeking workers. So it really allows us to uh, care for both sides of the house when it comes to work. I will tell you some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, unfortunately, COVID, the pandemic has had a similar impact on those with less than a high school diploma as many other economic impacts uh, in the past. For example, the Pew research um, let us know that in the height of the pandemic, those without a GED or high school diploma were experiencing unemployment at a rate of 18.5% compared to those with a bachelor's degree or more at 7.2%. And that's just indicative 
indicative of the differences in um, being able to uh, navigate economic changes with your educational level. But that being said, every level um, experience challenges. And some of the key things that we had to do and help ourselves and help our clients pivot is one, transitioning to a virtual platform. So um, many of our employer really, like um, Trent said, had to think about how they were going to recruit differently. And we had to come up with some quick and innovative ways to meet the needs. And some employers, unlike Trent and Buffalo Rock, there was a little resistance in transitioning to um, virtual platforms for employment. A lot of that is because they, the, although Jamie said it's been around for a while, they just didn't have the experience. So there was some education that needed to happen as well as equipment and software that needed to be made available for both the employers and those that were seeking work. I will tell you one of the biggest challenges we've had, um, and it's been a joy because we've really been able to work with a lot of folks in helping them think about the skills and experience that they have and how they're transferable. Sandrika just mentioned, you know, particularly in the small business environment, you really need to be able to look as a worker on how you can contribute to your employer's success, both in good times and in challenging times. And being able to demonstrate and articulate what those skills are that you have is key to that. And I think this um, was very new for many of our clients, thinking outside of not only a particular sector that they may have had experience in, but how those skills that they've built over the years could be transferred to other employers and other sectors. The other thing is we really had to think quickly on how we could support our workers who many, although they may have a full mobile phone, may not have access to technology that would help them transition in a virtual workforce. Many of the available resources like the public library were shuttered. Um, so making the changes within our own organization to allow a safety, uh, safe environment for individuals to come back and get the skills that they need because navigating uh, the employment world in a virtual way is different. You know, some folks are accustomed to online applications. Well, many of our employer partners went only to online. You could no longer walk up um, and fill out a paper application. So being able to comfortably um, complete that. So the digital skills that were required to successfully do that, but also the wherewithal and how to demonstrate the skills and abilities that you bring to an employer um, virtually. And then it was being able to navigate a virtual interview, very different from um, being able to have an in-person interview and helping our clients understand those differences from the subtleness of making sure you're in a quiet place to do um, the interview, the connectivity with internet, the equipment that may be needed. And we also made those um, technologies available to our clients. So I tell you, pivoting was, it continues to be the, um, the name of the game right now as we work with both our client, our clients who are looking for work and our employers who are looking to employ uh, individuals. I'm glad to say we're seeing an increase in the number of both um, job openings, but also individuals seeking employment at all levels of education. But there, it's certainly um, expedited some of the virtual and online job seeking and workforce development strategies that we all have to employ. And I think we are going to see just that continue to increase as we navigate this pandemic. So thank you, Dr. White. I look forward to questions in the Q&A and the breakout room. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tricia. Uh, the, um, speaking of the breakout room, when we do finish the Q&A period, um, all of uh, all of you that are attending will be given the opportunity to go into a breakout room uh, if, and speak ind independently or individually with uh, with our panelists. Uh, it'll be a good opportunity for you, perhaps, to network as well. So, um, so let's uh, let's proceed to the to the Q and A portion of uh, of the program, um, and let tee it up uh, with a couple of things. First of all. Uh, Jamie, in his um, in his overview, uh, talked about the impact uh, the impact of the of COVID as a disruptor. Uh, he he put it in context of disruptors that occurred during the Great Recession, but COVID has certainly been a unique disruptor. 
And, uh, and when you have a disruptor, uh, then it's about how you adapt to that. And uh, uh, Dr. Burgess's uh, use of, of the term pivoting, how you change quickly, go into a new direction, try something, uh, try something you haven't done before, I think is, it, uh, is also relevant to this, to this discussion. And some organizations have pivoted well and some not so well. Some pivoted quickly and some more slowly. Um, now, uh, right now we're in the period of disruption, but at some point in time, perhaps six months from now, perhaps a year from now, perhaps two years from now, we will go back to something we have been calling the new normal. So uh, let me pose the first question uh, to, to all of you. I'll, I'll perhaps start with Jamie. Um, and then anyone who else wants to comment on this, uh, I'd be interested in your comments as well. What things will permanently change in our labor market, in our businesses, some number of years from now, when perhaps most of our nation is vaccinated and we're at something that's normal, but not as normal as it was before the pandemic. What, what changes, what pivots that we've made are likely to be permanent? And Jamie, let me start with you. That, that is a great question. Um, and, and so I'm going to stir the tea leaves around here and then get back to you on that. <laughs> No, so in researching these trends, and again, I, I just started by jotting down what I've seen here locally and, uh, and then going out and researching, talking to others, researching it. And one thing, somebody that basically summed it up and said it a lot better than I could, talked about in, instead of it being so disruptive, uh, more of an acceleration and started pointing out things that, uh, that I had seen here that is, is not necessarily new, not new technology. As a matter of fact, technology has been around a while and we were kind of messing around with it and using it to some extent, but nothing like we have to now. The best example right off the bat I can give of that is here at the college. So, and come to find out good or bad, I'm I guess bad overall, but we wasn't alone in, in this, but when March rolled around and we all had to go to our respective homes, the college didn't close. Uh, we didn't quit educating students and teaching. However, <laughs> we had to do it in a whole new way, uh, almost overnight. So how, many, how long now have all of us in higher ed been reading about, talking about, and to some extent doing online courses? Uh, I've had my own uh, team members in the last few years when I would say something about, you know, I think we need to start putting more and more customized courses online or, or at least adopt that technology and start becoming more familiar because I'm, I'm being told that that's the trend for the future and it makes sense. Fast forward to March 2020 and now all of a sudden it's not whether we want to or not, it, you have to because that's the only, for a little, little while there, that was the only uh, avenue for learning or teaching or instruction. So, uh, but what my team members would say, and I'm sure this is widespread with, with educators across the country is, well, you know, well, number one, yes, we prefer traditional instructor-led courses, but so too do our clients. And maybe they do. Uh, I know I, I do. I'm just kind of old-fashioned that way. But I'm going to tell you when March and April, and I'm sure others have experienced something very similar, when March and April rolled around and we were working from home, there were a number of us working almost literally around the clock, transferring courses on to the online platform, getting that ready. Uh, and, and Dr. Burgos mentioned something that triggered a thought while I go on that is, you know, I, one of the things I did, and it was learning for me because it's not my subject matter expertise is transferring over to the digital courses, but spent numerous hours. Uh, we, we produced, I produced some uh, free online professional development courses, which nobody really thought much about. I was, again, they were free. It was just something to put out there. It was like soft skills and, and work ethics and time management and those sort of things. Well, one learning thing of that is and we didn't really advertise it. I mean, the chamber, you know, put it out on their website a time or two, and we didn't really advertise it. But uh, as of this past December, there have been, I don't have the numbers here in front, but it was like 2,100 and something people register from not just Muskogee and Georgia, but 13 other states and India <laughs> even. And uh, people are, and, and there's, and there are city governments from like Texas and New York that are sending their employees to them. And they're free, but 
the one thing I notice is that when you put something out online, even if you don't intend it to be that, it opens up our market and it, it opens up not just geographically, but also as Dr. Burgos mentioned, different populations, uh, especially like working moms and others staying at home. Now all of a sudden, maybe that's a platform they can take advantage of. So that's just one technology, but a major not so much a disruptor as an accelerator. This is accelerating what we already had and probably should have been moving faster towards and, and online retail. I mean, that trend's been shaping up for a little while now. So again, and it was almost overnight. We can't go to the stores, boom, we have to go. So I don't think, you know, a lot of it probably has to do Dr. White with how quickly this goes back to whatever norm was. And I don't, apparently, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like it's gonna go anytime soon. So I think the longer we keep accelerating these current technologies and current trends, you know, I think the proverbial train is leaving the station. I don't think there's coming back. So again, I would, I would term it as acceleration of things that's already out there, things we've been meddling with in some shape, form or fashion, but now having to by just by pure necessity. Uh, I would agree, agree with, with you that that the area of education, higher ed and public ed, is probably changed forever. It's not necessarily changed in a radical way. Uh, I think your, uh, your description of it as sort of an accelerated process is probably as good, is, is probably a good one. Um, uh, Trent, it, what do you think will, will, has changed in Buffalo, has changed in Buffalo Rock forever. In other words, what has the pandemic done to the company that that has what changes have been made that probably will stay with the company? Yeah, from a from a Buffalo Rock standpoint, obviously being out and being a, a provider of goods and services, um, we we the key words have been pivot and, and we're flexible with what's happening in the communities and in our territories. Um, as as uh, Jamie was speaking. Um, I was I was thinking through what um, Miss Trisha said about how she had challenged people and worked with people to find all their strong points and all their skills. And as we go into uh, a time of new normal, where some of old normal comes in, there's things that are changed forever. Um, we already are in a very instant gratification driven um, culture and society. And now um, we had to grasp um, conveniency uh, in measures because we were at home. So when you look at grocery delivery, um, when you look at what Amazon and those type of companies have done, um, now it may, and, and I don't wanna say this, but it, it's gonna change the landscape of opportunities maybe at the grassroots level that we've seen before, but those opportunities now shift to where maybe um, we have to have more CDL drivers. And if you look at what's going on in that area and the, the payments and, and what I'll do for a CDL driver, um, you know, and I think that's what Ms. Trisha was speaking towards to where, uh, and I don't want to put words in her mouth. Uh, I know she'll follow up on this, but, but maybe you have somebody that's never thought about a CDL, um, but you bring them in and say, hey, let me educate you on this. Let me educate you on same things of the trade. Um, and so that's what I think we'll see is, the instant gratification, the conveniency that this has brought on, I think that's gonna be here to stay and it's gonna change the shape of the retail marketplace uh, and, and the go to business. Trisha, did you wanna add something to what uh, Trent was saying? I, I definitely agree with the, the um, change that we've had. But one of the other things I wanted to mention, um, we as a society have been thinking about for some while and having conversations is around the gig economy. Right, particularly with the, the Great Recession, the last recession we had, that conversation was really there. Well, I don't even think we, could, we had conversation, it just happened. So the increase with e-commerce and the deliveries. So, you know, Walmart's now delivering um, groceries, Publix, Fresh Market, all, you know, everyone is shifting, but they are also depending on that gig worker. And technological platforms continue to improve and come online that allows individuals to um, use 
gig opportunities as their full-time employment or as a supplement to employment. So I think that's one of the realities that we will continue to see. Um, and as Trent said, individuals really need to think about um, transferable skills. And when I, you know, back in my days in the auto industry, we always talked to uh, about diversification. Um, and many people thought diversification was, well, I work with Chrysler, I'm going to work with Ford now. Well, no, diversification is talking about how do you understand what your strong suits are and how it can benefit another sector completely. So if you're providing Ford and Chrysler with seats, can you apply, can you switch to aerospace? Can you uh, na um, navigation in boats, thinking differently? And it's really from a worker perspective, if I've got great customer service, what does that look like for an employer when I need to um, go from face to face in a, in a dentist's office to a virtual appointment system? You know, how can I also continue to be a continuous learner? That's also been one of those buzzwords that are out there. But we have no choice. We all have to continue to be continuous learners because what we know is that time and technology is not standing still. And I think in particular, the worker perspective, there are several platforms that have come online. Many of you may know now that Facebook, for example, employers can advertise their work on Facebook. And it, if you are interested, it pulls in your profile information. It's very little. It doesn't give a whole, it's not like a full application or resume. But for people to think about, well, what do I have on my Facebook page? <laughs> you know, what um, information is out there that an employer will, that will be their first look. It isn't, a, it isn't an option of maybe an employer will look at my social media. You are looking for work now through social media platforms like Facebook. Um, so there are some of those things that um, I would say Jamie said it right. It's just been expedited. It's been pulled forward um, in a way that we just didn't see coming. Uh, and I think some of those things will continue to be the, be the um, trend. The other thing that I'm seeing is temp to perm opportunities. Those have been out there for quite a bit. Um, and that seems to be an increase it, from an employer perspective when they're recruiting is really, as Jamie said, I can, if I've got a virtual opportunity, I now have a plethora of talent across the country as well as across the world. So how do you um, compete in this new economy? Because I think many employers are realizing savings by not having um, brick and mortar operations going, but there's certainly a plethora of talent that's across the, the world that they were willing to tap into more readily. Now, not, out of, not all employers, particularly the small businesses, as Cedrica said, because Trent Steele still needs folks to deliver those beverages in the stores to us. But certainly as we think about how existing workers prepare and continue to be continuous learners in the workforce, but also those coming behind them as they think about career choices and options, how do I um, change my learning style or, or learn more about how to be more of an effective student virtually as opposed to being in the classroom. But that also has challenges for us that are preparing the workforce. So Jamie, you talked about your instructors uploading information engaging and ensuring that students and clients that we have are really able to navigate the resources we have available, are um, successfully absorbing the information, and then being able to put that those lessons learned into play in the workforce is those things are, are just going to continue. Um, Dr. White, can I add just a, a little bit of color to what um, Trisha has said? Um, I think that during this pandemic, we have really underestimated the impact the gig economy has had, especially on the small business um, businesses. When you think about restaurants and, and small restaurants, I'm not talking about franchises like Applebee's or Carrabba's. I'm talking about um, the Mexican restaurant down the street from your house. Um, when they were forced to kind of close their doors, how do they move their restaurant online to be able to deliver um, how do they move their restaurant online to be able to take online orders for you to pick up? Um, and the gig economy provided an opportunity and a platform to do that. Um, and without those platforms, without DoorDash, without Waiter, without Grubhub, um, a lot of those businesses would not have been able to survive. They would not have 
been able to afford to transition to um, an online ordering system. They would not have been able to afford just the ability to figure out how to create their own, but the gig economy and, and a, a system that already existed, they were able to say, hey, we already deliver. Are we able to charge a different service fee if, if people just picked up in the restaurant? That's not something that they were doing before, um, but because they were able to pivot um, and really adapt their business model, not only were they able to generate another um, line of revenue for themselves, they were really able to help those small businesses and those restaurants stay afloat um, during the pandemic. Um, uh, thank you for those comments, Sandrika. I was actually going to about to shift to you to ask you about the impact on small businesses, and you basically just gave us that. I think, um, uh, and, and I think the example of uh, shifting from storefront only to storefront plus retail is is an, is a great example of the pivot. It happened quickly. It was a survival mechanism. If you did not shift to delivery and you were in the food service business, you were almost out of business. Uh, and so, so I think that's a good example. In fact, I would say in long term, can you imagine any restaurant starting up in the future that won't build in uh, uh, delivery or uh, takeout? as part of their model from the get-go and maybe even outdoor seating will that be sort of the will that be sort of the new model of what restaurants of the future look like because all the data indicates that uh, this sort of thing is likely to happen again perhaps not as bad as covid but it's likely to happen again and uh, and so we're likely to have have to adapt or adjust um, again uh, Sandrika, any other thoughts about other small businesses that have probably are probably gonna be changed forever with regard to the way they do business. Um, yeah, so a lot of times when we think about small businesses, we think about restaurants, we think about um, retail establishments, um, but we also have to think about the small businesses that deliver a service, whether that's being an accounting firm, a tax preparer, even um, an attorney's office, right? The building that where the Chamber of Commerce is, we share space um, with a, a legal practice, a, a law office, and they have not been in the office since March, but they are still conducting business, right? So how were they able to shift um, their business model to be able to work from home? Um, and the, the, the small businesses that can figure this out fast um, are the ones that were able to stay afloat. So you think about the state of Georgia, which is still under a judicial emergency, which means they aren't having trials. Um, you know, it took the state of Georgia a while to figure out how can we conduct court online? Can we conduct court online? Can we do Zoom court? Um, but you have to look at those tax preparers. We're in the middle of tax season. How can I continue to provide my service to my client? Am I going to be able to do that on Zoom or Google Meet? Um, and the ones that have taken the time to figure that out are the ones that we are going to find as successful. Um, and so you will start seeing a lot more opportunities, whether it's your doctor's office, um, your accountant, where you're not going to even be offered the opportunity to come in. Um, your only option will be to do it over the phone or virtual. And we will start seeing that with a lot of our small businesses, whether it's retail, um, there are still many restaurants where you have to either order online or order to go to pick up. Um, so this this effect is is broad um, and and that it will have lasting impacts, just like the first question you asked. I don't think. Um, I don't think doctor's offices will ever schedule their patients the same. Um, I don't think um, courts will ever function the same. Um, I don't think restaurants will ever function the same. Um, and these are all impacted by small business. Um, I think you bring up some great points uh, that basically some things will never be the same. Uh, what will hospitality look like in the future? You know, will Las Vegas ever be the same? Will large sports events or concerts ever be the same? Um, they will probably have to pivot 
and we'll probably learn how to do that. But perhaps some things will never be the same. And so will our workforce ever be the same? And uh, Dr. Burgess, let me go back to you because you had mentioned um, uh, a couple of things that were interesting. One is, one is how women in particular in the workforce have been affected uh, by this. How will the workforce of the future uh, and I'll start with Dr. Burgess and anyone else can, can sort of add, how will the workforce in the future be different or have to be different uh, in a world where something like this either happens again or could happen again? And so we're just generally <coughs> going to change a little bit in anticipation of that. Sure. Um, you know, those of us who work in diversity and, and inclusivity um, are constantly looking at you know, diversity measurement and data on a regular basis. Um, the pandemic, of course, definitely brought a, a new level of flavor um, and through the lens that we were looking at it through. And what we have seen is that, um, and, and I love what um, Trisha and Chandrika and Trent have pointed out, around now that technology has literally opened up the playing field and, and you now have more opportunity to expand into recruitment and to attraction um, for your company or for your business. And it allows you know, not just one area um, to be sought after from, from a recruiting of talent perspective, but we look at that data and we can see now that due to the pandemic, the, the flavor of the workforce has started to expand. And it's expanding not just in gender and in ethnicity, which tend to be the two most prominent diverse uh, dimensions that people tend to look at when we talk about diversity management. But now you have location, you have geographical, you have uh, age um, and tenure, of course. Uh, that you actually now have at more access to that data to review. And particularly looking at women, uh, when we look at the data, uh, we have seen that nearly half leading up to the pandemic, nearly half of our workforce uh, are women already. You know, women are out here working, um, have been working, you know, looking at that, that particular diverse measurement. But now that, you know, due to the pandemic and the things that I had previously mentioned, uh, with the other factors that women are having to take in consideration, you are starting to see now a shift in what women are going to um, make decisions about doing. And one of the things that we heard, and I love again what, what the other panelists have said about transferable skills, is that the pandemic caused people to slow down, you know, and to think. And during this time that they've had that opportunity to slow down, they started really thinking about what do I do well? You know, what is really my skill set? And we started to hear, particularly from women who um, maybe they had a passion before to be, uh, to open up their own business. And what opening up their own business actually really been triggered? Um, you had some turn into actually authors. They took the time you know, to go back and pull all those wonderful journals and manuscripts that they had put their thoughts down on paper before. And we saw a, a lot of women become authors, you know, through this pandemic and through this shift. And they started to open up and to share more. Uh, we saw some saying, hey, I, I've always wanted to become a chef and to prepare meals, uh, not just for my family, but they took it a step further. So we started to see those type of things happen. Uh, particularly with women as we were talking to them in different uh, settings and different panels. And what we found is it wasn't just happening here in Columbus in our community. It was actually happening around the United States and around the world. Women were starting to do and make some of those very decisions um, about you know, how do they want to go, go about not only having an impact uh, in the workforce, but in their own, in their own home setting. So um, if any of the other panels um, would like to jump in there and share uh, from that perspective, please do so. I, I was actually going to ask Jamie if he would uh, be willing to comment on or give us some of his thoughts about future workforce preparation. What does, what does the workforce of the future look like compared to what it looked like maybe just a year or two earlier pre-COVID? 
So it, it, I was just thinking along that. I'm glad you asked that question. That's exactly what I was about to, I think, attack here. So we as, as workforce development professionals or workers, if we continue in the same mode of instruction and, and workforce preparation that we've been doing, uh, well, number one, we probably won't survive and keep the doors open. But number two, our workers will, the ones that we do produce will look the same and act the same and they won't be prepared for the new norm are, are going forward. So again, it comes back to being incumbent on us uh, as workforce providers. Uh, and I was gonna mention earlier too, um, there's a nebulous topic that we refer to, I think as labor exchange system. It's kind of like the economy. Everybody has one and we know it's good or bad or whatnot, or we have ideas about it, but you can't really touch it. So the labor exchange is simply put in any location, any region is supply and demand business and industry partners on one side and uh, individuals looking for work on the other side. And so the exchange system is how do we make those connections? And, and it's not my topic, it's been around a long time, but I became painfully aware of it when I was back with DOL, and especially here in Columbus, any day of the week, and this is, this is before the recession last time and certainly before COVID, but any day of the week, you could go in our lobby and there would be over a hundred people coming through looking for work in some shape, form or fashion. And we also had a number of employees posting job postings and holding recruitment fairs. And, and it just struck me one day, I thought, you know, this, this should be exciting. This should be easy, man. Why can't we just <laughs> make the connection, you know? And it, unfortunately, it's not that easy, I have learned. And so fast forward to now, and, and everybody that's on the panel here today is part of the labor exchange system. We, we all are, whether you're an employer or somebody looking for work, or especially those of us who are trying to make the connections higher ed, K through 12, the education system, also our, our, our workforce partners like uh, certainly Goodwill and Enrichment Services and, and others. It, it, fortunately, I think in our region, we have a lot of great pieces of the puzzle here, which other communities don't necessarily have. The challenge I think, and especially now, is, is how can we, because if we don't, who else is going to do it? How do we guide the, 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 the current workforce to become the workforce of tomorrow that helps our business and industry partners succeed. So it's a win-win. And you know, you know what, at the end of the day, I mean, that's pretty much it right there. And if we could answer that, we probably wouldn't be having this, this, this forum today, but uh, that's the million dollar question. And I would just, it's a challenge, it really is, whether it's here or wherever, but it really is, I think, incumbent on us. And the last thing I would say about that too, and again, kind of emphasizing the importance of, of all of our roles in this, um, you know, when we talked about the acceleration, and, and again, everything that's been said here, if you when, you when you read about it and you see it, all the trends, all the technology, it's been around for at least a decade. And we just have it, some of us embraced it fully and moved ahead. Well, now we have to. So the one other thing that can also be accelerated by this, and, and, and it could be unfortunate, uh, and this could be for business and industry as well as individuals, uh, the ones who are struggling already, uh, really stand a better chance of being left further behind. And, and again, that's on business and industry side and on individuals. And again, we've alluded to it today, mostly on the side of business talking about, you know, how can our businesses survive? And none of us can survive without the appropriate workforce, right? So that, that's a big challenge because not, not just out in our rural counties, it certainly exists there, but even here in Columbus, there's pockets of the population that really have been I'm not gonna say left behind on purpose, but for whatever reasons, they're struggling already. And now as we start moving forward and trying to help prepare even more and more people to somehow we've got to reach down a little bit further and, and make sure we, because again, if, if we keep, if they keep falling behind and you know what, it's not about skin color or politics. It's about poverty. And, and it's about people who just aren't, don't have the skills at this point for whatever reason. And it's incumbent on us. And that, I, you know, I think to me that at the end of the day, that's the most important part. How we do it, I'm not exactly sure, but this is a start and getting together and sharing ideas and then getting out and, you know, and trying to help. I think that's it. Uh, Tricia, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, Dr. White, I just wanted to speak back to something that um, Jamie actually said earlier um, when we were talking about this pandemic and COVID-19 as a dis disruptor or an accelerator. Um, some of the things and one of the things that we haven't really talked about a whole lot is the fact that a lot of our children were having to learn virtually during this time and how that affected um, the parents who are also working from home. And, and that's something, you know, this time last year, 
how can kids go to kindergarten online? It was just unfathomable. But um, when you think about this pandemic as an accelerator, um, believe it or not, the state of Georgia has a um, an accredited cyber academy that has been instructing kindergartners online since 2007. Um, so this is not unheard of. They've been doing this for quite some time, um, but now people realize that it truly is a possibility. And us as individuals, I think we have to challenge ourselves to shift our paradigm and trust the experts and trust the educators to, to understand that, you know, this is not new. Um, it may be foreign, but it is not new. Um, and if we can be more supportive um, of what they are doing in that area, I think that it will definitely help not only prepare our kids for what lies ahead of them, um, but it will also ease a lot of the concerns um, and the stress levels of those people who are working from home and also having to manage you know, their children um, at school. Because the skills that they are learning by having to go to class online, having to manage their schedule independently are not skills that employers take lightly. Um, coming into a workforce and understanding how to schedule a Zoom meeting or how to operate Zoom in general, not only just do that, but be a self-starter, um, get things done without supervision. Um, those are things that these students are getting very comfortable with um, in this pandemic, and those are also skills that will serve them exceptionally well when they enter into the workforce. Uh, thank you, um, Sandrika. I, I think a couple of uh, thoughts I had uh, sort of as we get to the end of our Q&A period. Uh, one of those is dis the disruption of COVID uh, has had a ripple effect on the workforce. It's not just a, a worker in, and in a particular industry uh, that's affected by themselves and alone. Um, there are people that are now working from home, but in working from home, there are other issues. There's the issue of how they're going to manage the education of their children if they're if they have children. Um, there's the ripple effect of uh, of of that empty space that many corporations and businesses have now that they may not have may, they may have decided they won't need in the future as our at home uh, work from home workforce perhaps grows in the post uh, pandemic period in a way it hadn't grown before. I think, Jamie, your, your comment on acceleration is probably apt here. There was a work, there were some organizations that allowed work from home. I just think that's it's going to be much increased in the future because so many organizations, and Dr. Burgess, this goes back to your notion of trusting your workforce. So many organizations have found out actually working from home works for uh, a larger part of their workforce than they thought before. And and what do homes look like? You know, the one area that's uh, done well during this tough time have been uh, a furniture sales, because guess what? Everyone's re-equipping or equipping a home office and not just for themselves. They're equipping uh, a schoolroom for their kids because uh, uh, because this is because some things perhaps after the pandemic won't change that much. Um, uh, well, uh, thank you all for your presentations uh, and for your uh, interesting and informative um, discussion following that. We're at the point now where uh, we're going to turn this back over to, um, to Kristen. Thank you, Dr. White. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. I know I have gotten a lot um, myself out of the discussion today, and I appreciate just everyone keeping our perspective so positive and really forward focused, uh, which is exactly what we are looking for. So that's wonderful. I wanted um, to thank also all of our attendees for joining us. We hope that you got as much out of it as I did. Have a great day. <laughs>